let me just uh, uh, frame it as toward a Buddhist approach to conflict transformation. And to be much more precise, it is one of the many, many Buddhist approaches. And the title is not a misnomer with toward because I have two concrete objectives. One is to simply articulate what as I aspire to study and to apply practice on. So this session is more of a of a apply agenda setting session, not so much of a report on any conclusion whatsoever. So I'll just make it upfront. Secondly, using this uh, um, forum as an opportunity, I want to invite you to comment on my agenda setting in terms of Buddhist approach to peace building. So I see in my mind a dialogue as I set forward my, my, my vision as to how to do this. Why Buddhism? Why should we care? And after all, I'm, I'm uh, in Washington, this area. This is America. Uh, Buddhism is not the uh, predominant religious tradition. We know that. Then why do people like us at an institution such as ESCA care about this? In my mind, there are three things that actually uh, articulate the importance of this. Number one is that if you really look at world religions and their contributions to either conflict or violence, uh, peace, uh, especially in America and in the West, there is a tremendous uh, development in terms of the scholarship and practice spearheaded by Christianity, Judaism, a, um, Islam, Hinduism, for example, has Gandhi. Now, Buddhist, Buddhism has many, many practitioners. But in my own modest uh, observation, there is not so much of systematic, at least social scientific way of capturing that knowledge, theoretically and methodologically, that keeps pace with the breadth of the practice. So that gap has to be filled. Why? Because we have many Buddhist majority societies, from Burma to Sri Lanka to Thailand to the Tibetan situation and East Asia, where Buddhist worldview is so important for war, war and peace. But at the same time, unless we really know how to systematize our understanding, methodology, and theory, we cannot actually do the training or capacity building, not to mention diplomacy or practice. Second, because of the reason I just mentioned, I think the Buddhist articulation of a theory and practice of conflict transformation would contribute to a further globalization of peace and conflict studies, which have been st you know, spearheaded by a, uh, Abrahamic worldviews quite capably. Third, as I speak with people, State Department and other people, especially in this country, this question of rising China and Asia Pacific is quite significant. And there is an increasing in attention to the economic sphere, social, you know, political and security sphere. But all of that dialogue and discussion is always based upon the understanding of worldviews. Now, China and Asia Pacific have so many worldviews. Buddhism is only one. Confucianism, Taoism, Christianity, Islam, all over. But Buddhism is certainly one tradition that needs to be looked at much more seriously. So it is for these and many other reasons that I think this um, emphasis on a Buddhist approach to peace building is quite important. Now, uh, before I go further, I want to ask you questions because true to the spirit of the Buddha, huh? coming up with the enlightenment and engaging people, I think the process has to be a little bit dialogical as well. And my first question is, how many of you have either lived in or experienced some worldview, some form of Buddhism, either by way of studying or traveling, whatever is okay? Good, thank you. Good, good. How many of you ha have worked on or um, studied very seriously the connection between religion and conflict religion and peace, I suppose, many people. Okay, okay, okay. And 
I want you to kind of keep in mind the learning experiences you have in those contexts. And I want to actually also mention to you that so much of the discussion is about agenda setting, a little bit of conceptualization. But eventually, toward the end of my discussion, I would like to open the floor and say, what does this worldview, what would this worldview actually mean for conflict analysis? For our understanding of social conflict as a whole? For our understanding of conflict transformation? In a way similar to a different form? Other worldviews you may be familiar with. And so please stay alert. The dialogical time, uh, time will come. And I invite you to comment on that. And I have a very simple, actually, uh, preview of what's to come. Number one is to talk a little bit about how I view the essence of Buddhism is. Secondly, to connect Buddhism to conflict analysis and transformation, I'll talk a little bit about this principle called dependent origination. Dependent origination, which arguably is a core of the Buddha's realization, enlightenment. Then, thirdly, I connect that discussion to possible implications for conflict analysis and transformation, at which point I open the floor and invite you to comment on that. At the core of my inquiry is this. How can we connect Buddhist ethics, a pursuit of individual enlightenment, to a collective form of social transformation in such context as structural violence? That is the biggest challenge, in my view, of Buddhist approach to peacemaking. So my understanding, I don't have any monopoly, but to me, Buddhism is a worldview, a faith tradition, and a way of life that seeks to open up unlimited potential inherent in human life by fusing into the underlying cosmic law of the ever-evolving dynamic interdependence between self and others between sentient beings and insentient beings. I want you to chew on that a little bit, it's because it's a little bit wordy, I accept that. But let me highlight only a few things. Number one is, Buddhism is a worldview that actually sees the potential for wisdom, social responsibility, etc., to be inherent. That's within life. It's not only human life, but life in general. I get back to it in a moment. Secondly, Buddhism is a practice that relates to the underlying law. So at this point, you see a different worldview from Iberhemic religion that actually sees God as a very important a, um, a, um, vision to, to, to work with. And third, oh, oh, oh. Okay. Third, because of the underlying cosmic law to which Buddhism is committed, it actually affirms the interdependence of beings, different beings, that are, are shaped and reshaped, that are connected to that law. So let me start actually um, unpacking this. Um, working definition, at least my understanding, by tracing the journey of Buddhism itself. And many of you know that Buddhism is a faith tradition that started with the enlightenment of the Buddha some 2,500 years ago. I myself uh, went to uh, Buddha's uh, birthplace some two years ago. And I wonder if uh, people are familiar with a defining question that guided the Buddha's journey. What actually prompted him to seek his way? And that evolved into what we know today as Buddhism. Do you know? Suffering. Suffering. This whole question of how can we overcome what appears to be inevitable roots of suffering? And sometime after Buddha's uh, death, the form of suffering came to be formulated as Buddha Gaya, the place of enlightenment, as four sufferings, 
Suffering is associated with birth, death, aging, and sickness. If you only use basic humanist term, you know, it's not the suffering associated with whether I want to have a car or this and that. It is about a much more fundamental sense of suffering. And it is said that the basic core of Buddha's uh, enlightenment is the realization as to how to answer that question. So how did he answer that question becomes a question. Long story short, part of the answer is summarized in the very first sermon that the Buddha is said to have given. And the sermon has two sets of points. Number one is the recognition of suffering, or dukkha. Number two is to look into the origin of the suffering. Where is the suffering coming from? Number three is the cessation of suffering. How do you actually stop or overcome suffering? And the number four is more of a practitioner mindset. How do you actually practice the overcoming of the suffering? And in this fourth point, the practice consists of eight elements, so-called the Noble Eightfold Path. To have a right view, to have right thought, right speech, a right action, right livelihood, for example, not getting engaged in unjust economic activities, harming other people, right effort to achieve these things, right mindfulness to be able to perceive it, Right concentration through some concrete practice, either through meditation or reciting of certain terms, etc., etc. So, right from the beginning, Buddhism has a concrete mechanism. And that centers on the question of how to overcome suffering with a practical element to it. Also, note that there is a little bit of analysis to it, causal analysis. And I want to actually use, start using my own language and get into the analytical mode so that we can start bridging Buddhism and conflict analysis and transformation. At the risk of oversimplification, the Buddhist theory of the analysis of suffering and transformation can be described as follows. Number one is to ask a simple question. What is dukkha, suffering? At the core of it, the suffering is a dilemma. Dilemma. Dilemma between one's attachment to the reality and impermanence, ever-changing reality. So the gap between impermanence and attachment to the perception that the reality shouldn't change much causes suffering. That's a sort of an oversimplification. Illustration. I am married to a very beautiful uh, lady, and as beautiful as she is, she cannot escape the aging as life's vicissitudes. So she could wake up one morning, look into her mirrors, looks into her mirrors, and then have a little bit of a sigh. Yeah? Because she discovers that the wrinkle is deepening. Wrinkle is deepening. And then when she comes down to the coffee table and I have coffee with her, I don't uh, try to talk about the roots of her side. Because I kind of sense that, yeah? But think of it very carefully. <clears throat> Aging causes you know, wrink wrink uh, wrinkles deepening. And as much as uh, ladies like my, my wife hope that she will never get uh, older, the reality is that she gets older. So there is a gap, contradiction, between the reality of impermanence aging, all phenomena changing, and the attachment to stay, to stay young. So back to this point, where is dukkha coming from? It is coming from suffering. Where is, uh, sorry, where is suffering coming from? It is coming from attachment, given the impermanence given the ever-changing reality of the universe and the life. And then and the Buddhism then asks, where is this attachment coming from? The Buddhist answer is, it comes from 
what may be called fundamental darkness or ignorance, which means that although you have the great potential within your life, either delusion or things that stand in the way of realizing that potential will prevent you from seeing it. So the Buddhist approach to transformation is, is to reverse the process. That's why we have the arrows here. Yeah? So the Buddha's realization under the Bodhi tree, basically, is that knowing this mechanism, first aspire to know the true expansive nature of life, meaning overcoming that ignorance and fundamental darkness about the true nature of life. And then that would alleviate and eventually overcome your attachment. Yeah? And then the attachment would give you a larger perspective of life that goes beyond life, death, aging, and sickness. Those things don't disappear. But you become larger than that in such a way as to overcome suffering. So this is, in a sense, the the most elementary uh, sum uh, summary of dependent origination, perceived as such by early Buddhism. And then, as you know, Buddhism has spread in all different directions. For centuries, there has been a quest for trying to understand what that enlightenment was. And it came from northern part of India. Within a few centuries, it spread, it spread into different directions, but for Buddhism to come to some other parts of the world, like East Asia, uh, it took it over a century and beyond. So in those processes of evolution and expansion, there are many scholars and practitioners who really asked, what was the content of the enlightenment? What do we mean by dependent origination? And about uh, three to four hundred years, actually not even three to four hundred years, within about hundred years of Buddha's death, there has been a debate that emerged between different Buddhist practitioners uh, about the content of, of that enlightenment. Some argued that um, some argued that the form of Buddhism that is actually spearheaded by the priests is not conducive to an open and dis discussion, di dialogue, understanding of Buddhism. Others argued that I think there has to be more of a people's movement as to how to understand it more universally. Yet, just cutting across all those complicated debates for over two millennia, the later evolution of Buddhism, especially uh, so-called Mahayana Buddhism tradition, does suggest a uh, condition genesis, the idea that all phenomena, life and death, arise out of causes and conditions. And this realization actually is said to have enriched the understanding of dependent origination. So the point is this, for condition genesis. You ask a question, where is the baby coming from? Where is the birth of the stars coming from? For any birth, any death, any phenomenon, there are causes and conditions. And importantly, the underlying rhythm of the universe that gives rise to those conditions and causes is actually interconnected. Dependent origination is said to have realized that underlying rhythm of these things. So if you apply this logic to a simple question, you have a tree, and then you ask a question, where is this tree coming from? What would a Buddhist and dependent origination answer to it? Where is the tree coming from? Condition genesis, causes and conditions give rise to it. What, what? From the seed, from the ground, from the water. That's right. From ground, light, manure, breeze, everything else. Tree is a tree because of non-tree. Tree is a tree because of everything that is not a tree. So if you say that, 
this given conflict is a conflict because everything else that is not that conflict. That's what Buddhist view would suggest. Now, waves. This is another metaphor. I think the Buddhist view would suggest that people in this room, maybe 20 or so people, would be all waves, going through lives and waves. Uh, you know, yeah. life, birth, age, uh, birth, death, birth, death, birth, and death. Where does this cat's wave come from? To expand this metaphor a little bit, I think the Buddhist view would suggest that I arise as a wave because of all the waves that are surrounding me, some of them getting submerged. But what creates ups and downs, even flow of the ocean? Because there is an undercurrent. What creates the undercurrent? Huh? There is the earth that has a magnetic force. And that resonates with the magnet of the moon, the interconnectedness between that, and interconnectedness between the interconnectedness and other galaxies' magnetic forces. All of them work together to create rise and fall of me, life, death, life, death, life, death in continuity. And what that also suggests is that <coughs> if you know that, if you know that, sorry, I think I am not familiar with the way I use it. If you know that, can we also shift the perspective and say that you as a wave embody the whole of the ocean? Your life is one with the life of the universe. Because there's no separation between where your wave starts, where your, your wave ends. So, to expand the notion of dependent origination, what that really suggests in this perspective is nothing emerges by itself in isolation, and every phenomenon, for example, suffering, relational conflict, arises because of everything else, causes and conditions, as I said. And here comes the a little bit of discussion part. If you could just uh, put yourself in the shoes of the people who may embody that worldview, how do you describe social conflict? This is a question I had ever since the very first class I took at AIGA. And then part of me was actually aching. I think there must be different worldviews that I'm not learning here. But I think it is my responsibility then to articulate. What do you think? If you accept this kind of worldview, how do you define social conflict? The first question I ask is, what would social conflict look like? My, my humble opinion is something like this. Buddhist approach to conflict, conflict, definition of conflict takes a little bit of a different view from a social scientific um, understanding of conflict I learned. And it looks something like this in my view. Looking at inter, 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 interpersonal conflict to start with, the core, the goal of Buddhist conflict transformation is to overcome suffering. This is not working. This one's better. Suffering in this case is a dilemma. Dilemma that comes out, out of contradiction. Between attachment and impermanence. But the conflict by definition is relational. Yeah? It's not only about what is happening internally. So then, conflict becomes externalized contradiction. And the key question is, how does this external contradiction actually deepen or alleviate the internal contradiction, which is a suffering, that touches on life, death, aging, and sickness? But at the end of the day, doing something about the suffering is the goal of Buddhist approach to conflict transformation, if you really accept the Buddhist world. But at the same time, this perspective on interdependence, you remember the waves, yeah? There is no such thing ultimately as self as the West teaches. We are 
here with the names because of the causes and conditions. Uh -huh. And interconnected because of the, the much larger uh, force of interdependence. So, my doing something as an entity, party to the conflict, will have implications for these connections. Then my co next question is, how does Buddhism look at conflict analysis? What does conflict analysis consist of? What questions do we ask? What are the causes and connections? Causes and connections. Mm. The entire process that somebody has within himself to, to, to address the suffering. So, I mean, what is the obstacles for addressing enter? I think so. You know, Buddhism, like any other faith traditions, do emphasize dialogue, but the dialogue has a purpose. Dialogue actually looks into the kinds of suffering that touches life and death, aging and sickness, yeah? So that gets to the basic of conflict analysis, not so much of the position or some surface matters here, articulated positions. But then if attachment is important, that blocks a pursuit of seeing the, the larger or tr truer nature of life, then you ask, what is the attachment that prevents you from seeing the greater potential within you that then gets externalized in relational conflict? Mm. And if it is a self-reflection that is required, that is good. But in conflict settings, that is very hard. So it has to be done in some partnership. The questions are very similar to the familiar methods we know, but slightly different in emphasis. Can I ask a question first? Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt. The, um, I'm looking at your diagram, and I'm looking at, uh, if, you, if I heard you say this correctly, in Buddhism, you want to relieve or get rid of the suffering, eliminate the suffering. Um, but in social conflict, we're not dealing with people individually. We're dealing with collective or individuals. And because life is conditional on one or another, there's a balance. And when you're in social conflict, if we want to look at it another way, if we use your conditions, we're out of balance. So therefore, when you're looking at the suffering of one person, or if we want to take it to another level, a group of people in social conflict, you're trying to restore balance. But can you do that in isolation without also looking at the others that are in contradiction as well? Right. Lose you there or no, you didn't lose me. I think you know, the way to phrase that question, there are different ways to actually uh, sh sharpen the focus of the conflict, uh, the question. And the way I have been grappling with, in line with the same line of thinking you, you, you just mentioned, is how does, what does Buddhism say about the collectivity? Structure of violence, structure of peace. Let me just bring it back to you because I said this is agenda setting and conversation. What do you think? This is really individually intrapersonal focus. Mm -hmm. At best, you can talk about interpersonal. You see, for example, Islam teaches zakat. There is a clear message in Islam of socioeconomic distribution. There's a sense of collectivity as a result. But Buddhism simply didn't start with the understanding of doing something, something about the collectivity. It is about doing something about this person in front of you that is suffering. That was Buddha's question. But now we're in the age of globalization. Interconnectedness is so massive. Basically, Buddhism doesn't lead into Marxist kind of explanation, I, I believe. It would be able to address culture. So through words, deeds, and thoughts, if Social, in, social perceptions and interactions prevent human beings from seeing the true nature, the broader nature of life. Then that may be seen as cultural violence. Now, social structures that actually enable a uh, greater potential of life to be seen with wisdom, social responsibility, and whatnot can be seen as structural violence. But it has a concrete mechanism of collective behaviors, collective uh, behavior patterns. You may want to call it collective karma, if you like. 
that has a particular transgenerational mechanism, behavior patterns. I mean, that much of articulation is possible, but beyond that is actually my research agenda. How do you actually see it? Otherwise, we cannot actually look at societies such as Burma, Sri Lanka, among other places, and do some systematic social engagement yeah, to deal with the collective challenges. So let me put it there. Then, what would reconciliation look like from a Buddhist perspective? Reconciliation. Well, I need, I need to go a step back for a moment. I, I have two elements that I'm curious about. One is around agency, and the other one is around freedom. If, if I am away, determined by others, what is my freedom to be up or down? What is the agency I have? And back to your question about the response to your wife, Wrinkle, I think that humans are actually endowed with a capacity for presence that is actually liberating. So I can think of a number of ways in which I can acknowledge the fact that the wrinkle is there and use the wrinkle as an opportunity to love in the present moment that is not the moment in which she was when I met her first. And therefore is the false memory of something that is no longer. So in a way the wrinkle is an invitation to me to love her again or love her because of the wrinkle. So I'm curious about around this notion of agency and freedom because it seems to me that it goes in the direction of the social dimensions of it. You know, if I am just a wave in the ocean, then who am I? Yes, I think I, I like that uh, question so much. In a sense that agency versus system, agency, free will, those are the kind of defining questions in Western social science. I think if Buddhism enters that picture, it would start with a completely different worldview to begin with. Yeah. The translation of the Western agency into the Buddhist thinking itself is a little bit of a kind of challenge. But to draw a parallel to that thinking from a Buddhist perspective, it goes something like this. People in this room are human beings. For a variety of causes and conditions, we arise as visible entities. But because of the underlying law of the universe to which, of which we are part, and we are connected by the rhythm, so to speak. And self and other is more of a perception as a function of that dynamic rhythm. It is not absolute in Buddhist sense. Self and other is not absolute. Uh, it doesn't deny that. But Buddhism also suggests that that realization of interconnectedness makes you a wave that is as big as the ocean itself. So smaller self and larger self, larger self and ocean as, as a whole. Smaller self, a wave. But there, as I said, there is no beginning of this particular wave and separation between this wave and that wave. And agency, I think the question of agency is answered and addressed in that larger context. So the question of, I think the basis of agency question has to be reframed a little bit, yeah? Do, do you see role for choosing, to use a different word rather than agency? Is human choosing of any relevance in Buddhism? I think so. By way of creating a consciousness about the wave and ocean connection, and then that becomes the ultimate choice that leads to so many other choices as to what action you take in conflict, violence, etc., etc. Now, as we delve into more concrete case studies later on, not in this particular seminar, I think you see enormous clarity as to what it really looks like. Let me just close the discussion about reconciliation. What would it look like? To me, it looks something like this. Okay. Yes? The green one, the blue one won't write well. The, yeah, there you go. I think to just make it make a sharp contrast as well as some similarity here. I think a Western Abrahamic notion of reconciliation you know, can choose to have an element of self, 
other. Yeah. Suppose self is the aggressor. Other is a victim. You can reverse that if you like. Reconciliation necessary is a relationship between them, as well as the intrapersonal dynamics of healing from trauma and guilt. But in the whole construct of this reconciliation process, there is God consciousness. So self will have to reconcile with God, as in my learning from Rwanda, for example. And the self plays and acts in such a way that there is also a connection between God and other. And in that whole consciousness, you try to have a reconciliation between self and other. Buddhism takes a different approach. It takes a different approach. To use a wave metaphor here. Self perceived other, perceived other, perceived other. Those all arise because of the causes and conditions. Reconciliation is to realize the undercurrents of the ocean. Reconciliation is to go back to the rhythm that gives rise to self and other. And we don't have to use the concept of karma, but the basic point is that time is extended into the past and future generations because life is continuity. And create, restore the relationship that is true to the interdependence that is said these to the practice of compassion, because you know I am connected to you. And again, that goes beyond the sense of the present generation into the past generations. So maybe there can be some similarities drawn, but I think these are different worldviews of reconciliation. What is the implication of not knowing this and practicing reconciliation in Buddhist majority societies? is a question that I want to pose. Okay. How about the societies that have Islam and Christian, B Buddhism as in, in Burma today? So those are some of the questions that we'll be posing here.